All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this presentation. This is uh, Alex Lorne from Catalyst IT. He'll be talking to you today about Moodle integration. Um, if you have any questions, put your hand up. I'll bring you the mic to talk into. Otherwise, if we're going to have a, an applaud, then pass it over to Alex. All right. Thanks. <laughs> okay. So, over the last year, we've built three sites that have some level of Moodle and Drupal integration. So this talk is kind of a, a bit of a bit of the journey we took, the modules we looked at, some of the things we discovered along the way, the different approaches we took in kind of discovering um, what we could do and what did and did not work. Um, first, I thought I'd start with, um, firstly, what is Moodle for those of you that don't know? It's, a, um, it's an open source learning management system. Um, so it lets people take courses online, um, they can fill in quizzes, um, get back the results, that kind of thing. It first came out of Perth um, quite a while ago. It's very mature, it's used all over the place in schools, universities throughout Australia and indeed the world. Um, recently it's sort of started to get picked up into the corporate space where they have um, training requirements internally to certify drivers to make sure they're not driving too long, all that kind of thing. So it, it's popping up all over the place. Um, it's got a lot in similar with, with Drupal. Um, it's PHP 5.2 5.3. It runs on MySQL, Postgres, and a bunch of other databases. So these are all familiar things. Runs on Linux. It uses um, Apache or Nginx. So it's a very similar framework. In fact, you can host it on the same server, even the same Apache instance, which means our scope for doing integration is huge. We can just reach right into the database, or um, it, it's very easy. So. Um, why integrate Moodle? We, we get people coming to us saying, we've got this Moodle, um, it's got all these courses on it, we have this other system over here that sells, so we manage the courses, we sell them, we process credit card payments manually, it takes up all of our time, we've got a full-time staff member dedicated to it, what can you do for us? And we'll say, well, Drupal. Drupal does everything. It's like modeling clay, you can make it do anything. Is where Moodle's a bit of a brick. You can color it, it still looks like a brick. It's very hard to extend it in some ways. Um, I know there are some people trying to implement a, a payment system into Moodle, but why, why reinvent the wheel when Drupal's got all that? So that's why we use Drupal to integrate with Moodle, just because it's so, so flexible. Um, so what kind of integration can we do? Um, so we can do shared, ac shared accounts. So this is Drupal and Moodle having the same username, same password. Um, so it immediately gives your users a kind of a feel of continuity. Uh, we can do some kind of single sign-on. So once you're logged into Drupal, click, bam, we're in Moodle. Sometimes if you theme the, the two sites the same, they don't even know that they've changed sites, which is perfect, exactly what our users want. Um, we can pull course information from, from Moodle into Drupal, which could be just the course title, it could be the synopsis, it could be who's, who's teaching the course, um, it could be who's enrolled, um, and then we can take that one step further, which is selling those courses in Drupal. So this is our integration with Ubercart or e-commerce. Um, there's kind of two different methods for doing that. I'll kind of touch on that a bit later. Um, next one is managing the enrollment. So once we've sold the course, we need to enrol the user in the course and potentially unenrol them once their time's up or if they've left the organisation. So we'll use Drupal to do that because Moodle doesn't really have an easy way to do that except unenrolling everyone from a course or manually going in there and click, click, click and removing one person at a time. So it'd be nice if that was all automated too. Um, we want to do shared... <coughs> Sorry. We'd like to do shared profiles. So it's, it's one thing to have a common username and password, but we also want to present a nice first name and last name um, and possibly a, a shared profile picture or address or any other information. Um, and if you've seen the Moodle profile, it's huge. You've got ICQ numbers and all sorts. I mean, who uses that anymore? But they're all there. Um, so it'd be nice if they're entered in one place as opposed to having users to manage two different copies and try and get them in sync. Um, and it'd be also good if we could pull some Moodle content out of Moodle back into Drupal, so presenting maybe a list of the forums or recent forum posts in Drupal. That's, that's all something we can look at doing as well. So before we really get into, our first step was to see what's, what's already out there. Um, surely someone has done this before, and it turns out they have. Um, there is a Moodle module for Drupal on Drupal.org, um, funny enough. 
Um, it provides blocks of upcoming courses and lists of your courses and tutors. Um, it's, uh, it doesn't do any kind of SSO, but it does, um, it does all this with a, you have to install a module called the QAPI, which is a, a RESTful web service in Moodle. So already you're modifying Moodle and Drupal at the same time. Um, so they can talk to each other. So in this, this particular module, they don't have to be on the same server. Um, it doesn't provide any form of shared authentication or SSO, um, which means before it to work, Drupal needs to know the username, the corresponding matching usernames in Moodle, um, which could be a big admin overhead. It kind of goes away if you've got some kind of shared authentication anyway, but this module's not giving us a whole lot um, other than some just peripheral information, and it was a kind of a good start to see what's out there and how we might approach these things. Um, it also happens that this module's kind of a bit, bit out of date, a bit dead. It's Drupal 6 only, it's Moodle 1.9 only. Moodle 1.9 is end of life in June or July this year, so it's kind of almost the end of the road for that. Um, it also requires, um, oh, let's see, yeah, new usernames. Okay, so then we thought, well, what about the other way around? What's, what modifications, modifications for Moodle are there that we can make um, to integrate Drupal. And it turns out there's a Drupal module for Moodle. Um, so the problem with this module though is it requires a um, shared domain. Where's my... Okay. So it has to be on the same domain, example.com and example.com slash Moodle, which is fine if you're building the sites up from scratch, but not of our clients are that flexible. They might have a Moodle just in the corner and we want to install Drupal on a brand new server, which kind of makes that somewhat difficult. Um, this one is a little more up to date than the last one. It's Moodle 1.9 and 2, although the Moodle 2.2, which was just released to support, is a little bit ropey. So the guys are still working on that. It's Drupal 6 only, but the Drupal 7 module is in progress. But what does it do? Um, it's syncing profiles only, pretty much, language settings, and it will create accounts. So again, it's very limited in scope and what it can do. But again, it was kind of a nice look at what Moodle could do in terms of Drupal information. integration, modifying the Moodle only, without really having to do anything to Drupal at all. Um, to make this work, we needed to have direct access to the Drupal database from Moodle. So Moodle can read and write to everything in Drupal, which could be a little bit dangerous if you're not really sure of the state of the Moodle. Um, so yeah, that was what's there. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Mnet. Moodle, Moodle networking is Mnet, is what Moodle uses to talk to other Moodle um, servers. So we looked at that and we thought, what's out there? And if you dig hard enough, you will find someone's half attempt at building a Mnet implementation for Drupal, but it's long dead. So we kind of looked at that, saw it was dead, and then just kind of dismissed it. Um, out of hand, even though potentially it's very good at migrating courses in and out and doing single sign-on. Um, we didn't want to go through the whole process of implementing Mnet, only to find that um, it didn't work, and particularly with Mnet being discontinued in some future unknown release of Moodle. They've already said it's dying, but they don't know when, so we didn't go too far with Mnet. So we thought, okay, what can we do with Moodle and Drupal um, that doesn't require any, any modifications at all. Um, and it turns out there is actually something we can do, um, which is um, sharing accounts, which is using the Moodle external database authentication plugin. Um, so this is something that's part of Moodle, we just turn it on and it will reach into the Drupal database and just pull out the username and password directly and then let people log in with that. Um, so how do we do that? We just go into, as an admin user in Moodle, log in to admin users authenticate and then manage users. We get a nice little screen which has got a list a mile long of different authentication plugins that, that Moodle can use. Um, so we find the external database one which conveniently is right in the middle here. Um, we turn it on with a little eye thing and we configure it, which is my next slide. Um, so we get a screen, it's pretty boring. We get where's the database, what's our username and password we connect to the database as. So this is our chance to limit the scope of the, what the Moodle can read and write. We can just create a user specifically for this that can only read and write the one authentication table or read only. Um, we tell it which table, which column in that table is the username and which column is the password. Um, so very simple, that's at a bare minimum. Um, once you've done that, you can then start specifying other things like the first name, the last name, 
email address, address the ICQ number again, um, and also a password reset URL. So this lets people, if they've logged into user Moodle and they've forgotten their password, to actually reset it through Drupal, which if you talk to anyone who's done any admin on Moodle is probably their number one call, which is, I forgot my password, how do I do it? So this lets you provide a nice, simple Drupal email mechanism or whatever to do the managed authentication. Um, so the one, there's two real downsides to this, this approach is people still have to log in twice, once to Drupal and once to Moodle. Um, and that, that can be a little bit why I'm already logged in, particularly when the sites are themed the same. Um, and it also requires a direct database access, um, which may not all be possible. So moving on to what else is available. Um, and so we're looking at OpenID. This is, this is our first real SSO um, technology for, for doing this. Um, so to do this, we set up Drupal as an OpenID identity provider. There is a module that's well supported on Drupal.org uh, for this. Um, and similarly, we set up Moodle as a open identity consumer. Um, the module for this is a little bit ropey, um, but it does work. Um, I'll get onto why it's a bit in a second. I shall do that now. Um, if you've got Drupal, if you've got Drupal set up to sell courses and that, you'll have it on have an SSL version of the site too. So OpenID sees that as actually two distinct OpenID providers, one for HTTP and one for HTTPS. So you have to enable the multiple open authentication um, in, in Moodle, which is fine until you suddenly realize that that means they can use Google or your own OpenID server at home to authenticate to Moodle. So suddenly you've lost control of where your authentication source is coming from, which is kind of not the point of this at all. We really want to lock it in to who, who can log in. So we had to modify the OpenID module just a little bit to say, no, only, only the Drupal server. And to make things easy, you can just regex out the HTTPS. So Moodle thinks everything's just coming from the one server when it's trying to compare where they're coming from. Um, oops. It's only Moodle 1.9. That's the only other problem with this. The Open Identity Consumer is 1.9 only. They're working on a 2 version, um, but um, that's, who knows. So it's kind of, it's a nice solution when it works. You do just click on the link in Drupal and bam, you're into, into Moodle um, without really knowing what's going on. Um, yeah. So next up we thought we'd try um, Simple SAML. Simple SAML is kind of the new kid on the block in terms of all singing, all dancing, um, SSO. Um, it lets us connect to third party identity providers, so Google, Facebook, Yahoo, Lit, Twitter, LinkedIn, anything, you name it, they all have some kind of remote authentication service using OpenID or OAuth or some other thing. We don't really, really care about that. Um, but how does it work? Um, setting up is a little bit, little bit more of a, um, a challenge than doing the OpenID. Um, pure open ID. Oops, that's not quite really. No. Um, so we install, we have to go to simplesaml.org, download the actual identity provider service. This is a separate third PHP application that we run on our server, usually on some other domain. Um, there's a Debian package for it. There's, I think there's Windows ones. It's just a PHP application. It requires memcache or something for cookie management, but once, once that's installed, then you install the Drupal Simple SAML module and the Moodle Simple SAML module. You do a bit of configuration to tell it what identity providers you want to use, um, Facebook or Google or whatever. Then you craft a URL, which is basically a link to the identity provider telling it which, so this is out the one we've installed, which service you want to use, so Google, and where to come back to once we've logged in. Um, so fingers crossed, I thought I might give you a quick demo of what that actually looks like. Um, if not, I've got some slides that kind of do the same thing. Click here. Whoops, where's my mouse? So this is a, a Drupal 7 site. I've logged in, I'm, not, I'm an unauthenticated user. I've just landed on the page. So I'm gonna click on, click on Google. It's gonna whisk me off to Google. There's a bunch of redirects happening in the, in the bottom here. Um, it's going to ask me to log in, so I'm just going to log in with my Gmail account and password. 
Put it on that right. And it's going to take me back, back to Drupal logged in. So at this point, I haven't actually given Drupal anything. It just knows that Google's authenticated me. And now all going well, I can click on Learn, which will seamlessly log me in to Moodle in one go. So <laughs> there are slides of that, just in case it didn't go wrong. <laughs> just went wrong. But um, and, and the, the really cool thing here is um, because Moodle now knows about my Drupal account, it's stored in a table my Drupal ID and my Moodle ID side by side. So later on, I can ask Moodle, or I, for this Drupal ID, give me the Moodle ID, which gives me access to the Moodle account. Um, one of the tricky things about this is it creates some really god-awful username for you, which is just a, basically a hash. So you have to go through in Moodle and kind of tell it, no, my username is actually this. Um, so this is where the shared profile comes in really, really important. And again, in, in Drupal, it creates usernames that are really horrible as well. So that's where there's a real user module, which will let you pull in the username, um, first name and last name from the profile instead of displaying the actual Drupal username. So that's a that's a single sign-on. Um, I'll just switch back to my presentation. So that was logging in, coming back over to Moodle. Okay. So once we've single signed on, that's great. But what about the rest of the integration? We we really want to pull courses courses out of Moodle. Um, so how would we do that? Um, oh, showing us courses and categories. We want to do course enrollments. I've kind of been over this. Um, we want to sell those courses in Ubercart or your favourite commerce module, which I believe there's talks on later on in the conference. Um, we want to expire the enrollments once people are done. Um, so one way we can do this is multiple databases. So this is this is in in Drupal in our settings.php. We just define two databases. So our top line is just our regular default one, but you can actually set that up as an array and define the Moodle database as well. And then when you're in your module, um, down the bottom, you just set the DB active to Moodle, make all your queries. You have to be really careful here. If your queries blow up or the Moodle, access, Moodle database is not there, you have to make sure you catch that exception and switch back to the default Drupal database. Otherwise, Drupal will continue on merely along the way going, where are all my tables gone? Why can't I write to my logs anymore? And you'll get a massive big stack trace. Um, so you really don't want your Moodle taking down your Drupal site. So I've kind of left all that out to keep this, keep this simple. Um, and I thought, well, that's Drupal 6. Um, Drupal 7 looks kind of similar. You don't do it in settings.php anymore. You set up an array and register um, an additional database connection. But you do the same thing. You switch to the Moodle database, make all your queries, and then you switch back to the default one. Although you'll notice you no longer say default. You just call the function. So you can call it anywhere. It's quite safe to call that. Um, as kind of a fail-safe. I want to really, really make sure I'm back to Drupal after I've done all my Moodle stuff. OK. Oops. Um, the second one is Moodle Web Services. So this is the scenario where you don't have your Moodle and Drupal on the same server. They're on separate servers or indeed in different databases, that data centers all around the world, which, is, which could be common. Um, so we need, um, this is kind of, there are web services in Moodle. Um, but they don't have everything we want. So this is kind of a really short demo on how you would modify the web service support in, in Moodle to provide whatever information you want. So this is a really trivial example. Um, the first sort of three lines are the actual function that's doing the work. In this case, it's just getting me the records of the courses that are available. But you could customize that to be, get me the forum posts for Fred, get me um, all the courses that Jane is teaching. Um, the second part is registering that as an actual XML RPC callback. Um, and then finally on the bottom is our Drupal code on how we would actually call that XML RPC. So it's, it's simply saying, get me the address to the actual server and then um, making, making the call. And we get back an array, which is a list of all of our objects in our, in our course. Um, so what do we do with that, as I think is the next one? Yeah, I'll, that's my slide, but I'll, more live demo time. Um, so here's a, here's a Moodle. Um, it's got a list of courses. So I thought I'd just say the linked one is our Drupal, which happens to have the same list of courses pulled through. Um, 
and so we can see all the courses that are available and I'll select a couple in this, this scenario I have to select three I'll go right down the bottom oh it's asking me for a name and oh. you still have a manual very nice. So here we can see I've created a product in Drupal using Ubercart. I've made the XML RPC call to Moodle saying show me the list of course categories, show me all the courses. I've displayed them hierarchically so we can kind of select which ones are available. Um, and then I've added an object to, the, to my shopping cart with those three courses that I selected down the bottom. Um, and from there, it's pretty standard checkout. I just go through. I won't do that because I don't want to pay for $114 for some training. Um, now we'll just switch back. Sorry. Why can't I switch? risk of doing demos. There we go. Okay, so once we've bought the course in Drupal, that's great, we've got a record of it being sold, the person's got an email saying, hey, you're enrolled in these courses, but we haven't actually enrolled them yet. So this is where our, um, we use the external database plugin for Moodle. This is very similar to the external enrollment plugin. Um, so it's part of Moodle core. Um, we have a table in Drupal that's, it, all it really needs at a minimum is a username or a, a Moodle user ID and the course ID that they're enrolled in. Um, we had a few extra things in there to make unenrollment possible. So we had an expiry date and maybe an email to contact them on once we've, once we've unenrolled them. Um, then we add a conditional action in Ubercart. This could also be just a module um, or some other hook that runs once Ubercart has finalize the, the payment. Um, conditional action is kind of nice because you get a nice little GUI that says um, run this custom function, PHP function down the bottom once, once you paid for it. Um, what does that function look like? It's pretty simple. This is just bread and butter Drupal writing to a custom table. Um, uh, the trick here is, there are, I mentioned earlier on, there are kind of two different ways to um, sell courses. One is if you're just selling an individual course, which is where you'd use the Drupal Ubercart, just the SKU field, which is the kind of your product code. You just put in the, the Moodle course ID in there and then that gets carried through all the way through the shopping cart for you, no extra work required. And you can just pull it out at this point um, with the, the model. Um, in the case of the skill gate which I just demoed, we're actually selling three courses per item. So we need to find a way to include those three different things in, in, the, in the model, which is just depending kind of accessory data, similar to how you would have attributes that give um, shop items different colours or um, different size t-shirts. You'd have different Moodle courses that are available. But it all boils down to writing multiple rows to this database saying user Joe is enrolled in course word basics. Um, and then we go into Moodle and we go into our external database enrollment. We configure it the same way we configured the other one, giving it an IP address, a user and all that. So again, we can lock it down so they can only read from this table. Um, there's a few more things behind the scenes here. We need to tell Moodle how we're identifying the course. So we can either match on the course ID versus course ID in Drupal, or we can use course name versus course name, or um, some other identifier that's unique between the two, we do the same for the user, so again, username. A common way we did on one was the email address because we weren't 100% sure that the usernames matched across Moodle and Drupal, but we knew that the email addresses did match, so we use that instead. We can also use, there's a, there's a checkbox which is unenroll users when they disappear from that table. So there's immediately our mechanism for unenrolling users. We enable that and then all we have to do to unenroll them is delete that row or somehow make it no longer match. So that could be as simple as just renaming the, the user ID to underscore removed or something like that. Moodle will go, oh, I can't find this row anymore, and unenroll the user. Um, so very powerful. Um, 
the one trick we had on this one is if you're using SSO and your users are logged in to Drupal and Moodle at the same time, they go and buy a new module um, in Moodle, they come back to Moodle and they go, why aren't I enrolled? I just got an email. Because the enrollment plugin only checks for new enrollments on login to Moodle. So we found we had to sprinkle the check enrollment plugins for the user snippet in a few key places in, in Moodle, which is basically hacking on core. Um, it's a naughty, but that's kind of what we had to do. The only other approach we had was actually running a cron job, which is a bit ugly as well, or doing a web service call. Um, but just putting that in the right place, that seemed to solve the problem. So immediately they click on a link um, on the thank you, you've just paid for this module. It single signs them on, make sure they're signed into Moodle, does the, does the enrollment check, and bam, the course is there. So it's, the integration is just fluid, it works. Um, we can't afford to have them waiting five minutes for the cron to run. Um, Finally, um, sharing profile information. Um, we, we want to have, if they edit their profile on, on Drupal, we want it to come through to Moodle. Um, part of the Simple SAML is a web service that, um, oops, oh, getting ahead of myself. So on hook user update, so this is a, a, a Drupal hook. So whenever they save their, their profile in Drupal, we, we have a module that does a hook user update. And all it does is that, which looks a bit ugly. The first sort of four lines are saying, hey Moodle, for this Drupal ID, what's the corresponding Moodle ID? So remember when we're back in Simple SAML, we store all that data? So this is an example of a web service that's calling the get user by remote ID, telling me who the Moodle user is. And then finally, we build a, an object, an array, which says first name, last name, a URL to their profile picture, um, and whatever other profile information we want to we want to pull across, we put that all into array. We call this this uh, profile XML RPC function, and Moodle sucks it in. The interesting thing we found with Moodle is it actually immediately goes and gets that profile image. It actually does an HTTP request on the fly back to Drupal saying, "Give me that profile image." Sucks it in, resizes it, formats it for how it wants to, and stores it locally. Um, which is kind of tricky if your hook user update hasn't finished saving. The, the profile image um, straight away. So that's something to, something to be aware of. Um, but it does mean that the, the profile image then gets served up locally. Um, and the, the, the key thing here also is we don't have to modify Moodle in any way to show the information that's from Drupal. Moodle's storing a copy of all that locally. It's kept up to date by Drupal. So wherever Moodle needs to show prof profile information, it's pulling the information directly. We don't have to go around modifying Moodle in a hundred different places and maintaining that to display the correct profile, profile information. So that first function is part of SAML. Um, it's, it's just core. The second one is one that we wrote that we're trying to push upstream at the moment. Um, right, so I just want to have a quick word about Mahara. Um, Mahara is kind of a, it complements Moodle. It's an e-portfolio system which lets users show off their work, kind of like an artist profile. I've completed all these things, I've got the certificates, it lets people talk together about common courses they've been on. Um, the reason I bring it up is it's built on all the same technologies as Moodle and Drupal. It's PHP, it's MySQL, Postgres, Apache, Nginx, it's, it's all there. And most of the techniques I've just described all work for Mahara. We can do the simple SAML single sign-on, in fact I can give you a quick demo of that as well, it's, um, hopefully. Um, if I go back to the one that I signed on here, I should be able to click on portfolio. There we go. <laughs> Not today. Okay. Um, and it single signs us on through. Um, we can, um, yeah, we do the open ID. We can do the shared database because it's still Postgres and MySQL. Um, there's extensive web services in Mahara for pulling and pushing forum posts for um, describing artifacts which are an analogy of a Drupal CCK type, where you can share those using exactly the same things. Um, we can pull out user listings, who's, who's following you, who's liking you, that kind of thing, can all be pulled from Mahara into Drupal, so as a block or, or however you want to, to customise it. Um, yeah, so that's about it. Um, it's about half an hour. So has anyone got any questions on how we might, any ideas or? 
Yep. So reason why? Sorry. Yeah, just about the versions of Drupal, versions of Moodle. Um, I think what I've seen, Moodle 2 doesn't work maybe as well with um, Drupal 6 due to PHP differences. Yes, so um, Moodle. Wow. Um, so, yes, you're right. So. Oh, so so middle. Middle two um, does require a newer version of PHP. Um, it's five five three only. It's a Drupal six. Um, some of the contracts are a little broken on five three, but it's five five two. Um, it's all all comes down to testing. If you're going to integrate Drupal six with middle two, then it's, it's all about testing. It does work. Um, we are integrating Drupal seven with middle two Check. and Drupal six with one line. Um, mainly because at the time when we started the integration, that was what's allowed. Drupal 2 wasn't stable, Drupal 2 wasn't stable, Drupal 7 wasn't stable. But now that they've kind of both are, uh, any new projects start to help both one of Drupal 7 and Drupal 2. Um, so that one kind of goes away. Right. So, um, yeah, so Drupal 6, uh, yeah. actually, so Drupal 6 is the latest tech, the latest uh, patch versions and things will go with Drupal 2. Yes, yep. Yeah. Yeah, as long as you're happy that it's, it's, Drupal 6 is fine on PHP 5.3, it's only really some of the contract that can be a little bit sketchy and it's not sure about. So it uh, just depends on how massive the amount of contract model you've got as to whether you have problems or not. Um, all of our sites we're going to see now are PHP 5.3, we're back to that process. Uh, and we weren't meaning there are a few, we weren't meaning there. This is more about the authentication that you were talking about is um, what happens when users come back to the system and then forget they used Google last time and then use Facebook this time? Right, so in this particular example, um, we, we set up so users can authenticate to multiple different authentication sources. So when you, you come back through Facebook, it said you, you're asked for an email address to kind of, when you first register um, to prove that you are allowed to register this site. In this particular case, it's a Department of Education, so you have to have a .edu page address. Um, and it goes, hey, someone's already registered for this address, proof who you are. We send them an email to say, yep, you're, you're, you're Alex, and click on that. And then they can log in with both. They can log in with Facebook and with, with Google. There's no limit to how many different um, education sources you can use for the same Thanks, Alex. I just had a question about, I wasn't sure why I quite understood the integration between the uh, Moodle courses and bringing those back over to Drupal and, and selling it to the Moodle card. I was just wondering if you could, if you could follow through that uh, step by step again. From an admin point of view, it seems like there's a possibility for somebody to create a Moodle course, um, but the pricing information is all back in the Google card. Yes. So you actually have a, an admin process here that needs to be manually synchronized so that people don't create Moodle courses in one department and the pricing people haven't gotten around to it yet. Uh, yes. So there's an empty, a node will be created on import, but there's no pricing information yep. attached. Could, can you talk a bit more about that? Yeah, so we've tackled that in two different ways. So on, on the scenario where we're selling three Moodle courses per training, the training is the product and it has a fixed price. So any new Moodle courses that show up, just show up as another option to provide. There's, there's no pricing per course in that scenario. The courses per day's worth of training is just $500 or whatever, whatever it happens to be. So there's no real admin overhead there. Um, the other scenario is where you're, having, you're selling individual courses for, for Moodle. So your options there are to just set a default price or, and then have it show up and have a, have a cron job automatically ask Moodle, give me all the courses you've got, oh here's some new ones, set a default price, or have them come through as a, a, um, an, a node that's not published yet in Drupal and then an admin has to go in and set the price and publish it, or, or some mechanism like that. Um, but yeah, there is an admin overhead to that scenario. With the examples that you were showing about um, configuring connections 
between systems. Yep. Do you want to talk just a little bit about the security? Is, is there any security issues associated with that? Sure, sure there are. Um, so when, when the, the Drupal and Moodle live on the same server, not really. Um, it's when you decide to start putting them on two different servers, maybe in two different data centers, you do have to open up a MySQL or a Postgres socket from one server to the other. Um, so that comes with all the, the security issues you have of putting that on the internet. So you'd have to file it off so it's only accessible over one IP address. You would have to make it so only one, one particular database user can connect with a password or MD5SUM. Um, if you're really paranoid, then you have to run that over a VPN of some kind um, to just take it essentially off the internet. Um, that's Drupal and Moodle really don't care. Um, they just want to open socket to a database. Um, so yeah, there are some security issues there, which is why I was talking about locking it down so that user can only read and write to that one table, not all of the whole Drupal space, which is what those two modules I was first talking about, both did. Um, so you, you do have to be aware of these things. So yeah, good question. Hi, can you just, um, are, are there any implications around logging out of one of these applications when they're all joined together? Yes, there are. So in, in the scenario where you're in the, um, the open ID and you log out of Moodle, Moodle doesn't really know about the fact that you're logged into Drupal. And that does cause problems um, because you can still be logged into to Drupal. Or the other scenario is if, you're, if you sort of switch, log out of, you logged into Moodle and Drupal, you log out of Drupal, log back into Drupal, you can now be logged into the systems as two different users, which can, can cause confusion. Um, the only real confusion that causes for admins who tend to do that a lot, end users tend not to switch, switch user accounts all the time. Um, I think the simple SAML deals with that a little better because it will kind of log you out of everything because it's not logging you out of the individual application, it's logging you out of the identity provider, which is the, the third application you install. So that handles it a little bit better. Um, it's still a problem though if you decide to go and log in manually, but again, that's only really admins who, who do that. Um, but it's definitely something to be aware of and part of your testing. I think there's a, another question in the back. Apologies if, I, if you've already answered this in the course because I was missed most of it. But um, if you uh, have the desire to create uh, video content that can be sold under a premium account basis with subscription with Ubercart, that's in, held in Moodle. Yep. Um, can that content be then held on a CDN or, or stored elsewhere, like Ustream, for example? Yeah, um, I mean, that's kind of Moodle will do that for you. So if you've got a plugin for Moodle that's just for showing that content, um, Moodle, to a certain extent, doesn't care how you've got access to that through Ubercard or, or whatever. So um, there's no reason why you couldn't do that. Um, I know particularly with um, uh, SCORM objects in, in Moodle, you do often do want to host those externally. Um, and Moodle will control access to who's got those. Um, kind of as an independent um, sort, of, sort of thing. It just, it's just a course as far as Ubercard's concerned. Do you have access or not? Yeah. Um, might get tricky though if you wanted to take that one step further and sort of show a preview of the course, then you'd have to really get some funky um, access control around that. Um, yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but as you know, Drupal's really good at displaying video and, and all that kind of thing. You can just sort of do that as part of it. It's a regular CCK type. Anyone else? That's almost time. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, I do have a few links, so I'll put all these slides up um, on, on the Drupal uh, down under site. There's just links to all the various modules I've used, um, some of the ones you've contributed back to. Um, if you've got any questions, come and ask me afterwards. Um, I'm happy to talk about some of the ideas you've got. Um, already today or yesterday, um, people were talking about how they might do pulling in more course content, which is something we haven't wanted to do yet, but you wanted to just sort of display the most recent forum posts or whatever ideas, keen to, keen to hear them for further um, integration um, beyond just selling courses and simple so high level integration. Okay, thank you very much Alex. Thanks.